Um, Professor Robert O'Cohen and dear participants, very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to today's special nice webinar with Professor Robert O'Cohen. We are really honored to have him here tonight to have a discussion on international regime complex for climate change. Professor Cohen, warm welcome to our event. Uh, Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is an independent, apolitical, and non-partisan think tank which believes in freedom, democracy, and world free from conflict. We envision a world where source of insecurity are identified and understood, conflicts are prevented or resolved, and peace is advocated. Climate change is one of our major research topics here. We'd like to thank Professor Cohen for his valuable time. Before we start, let me briefly introduce Professor Cohen, though he need no introduction to this uh, gathering. Uh, professor Robert O. Cohen is a prof Emeritus Professor of International Affairs at Princeton University, United States. He is the author of After Hegemony, Cooperation and Discord in the World Economy, Political Economy, which was published in 1984, and Power and Governance in a Partially Globalized World, which was published in 2002. He is co-author with Professor Joseph Nye of Power and Interdependence, which was published in 2001, the third edition of it and with Gary King and Sidney Verva of Designing Social Inquiry, which was published in 1994. He has served as the editor of the journal International Organization and has president of the International Studies Association and American Political Science Association. He won the Graham Year Award for Ideas Improving World Order in 1989 and John Sky Ted Prize in Political Science in 2005. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science, the American Philosophical Society, and the National Academy of Science. He has received honorary degree from the University of Aarhus, Denmark, and Science Co in Paris, and is the Har Harold Laswell Fellow from 2007 to 2008 of the American Academy of Political and Social Science. Professor Cohen, let me once again welcome you to our program. Before we start, I would like to request all our participants to share the questions in the Zoom chat or, or on the Facebook Live. Feel free to share, share our live program on social media. So Professor Cohen, the first question for today is, what do you mean by the inter international regime complex of climate change? Well, thank you very much for the introduction and, and, and for the questions. It's a great pleasure to be spe speaking to you. Uh, I've never been to Kathmandu and I would love to come sometime. Uh, but right now with, with COVID, this is the best way to interact. Before I answer your question, which I appreciate, I wanna say two things that are not about the politics of climate change that are probably evident to all of you, but that we should at least be, be clear we all understand. Um, the first thing, the first point is, and these are both different from when that article was written, which some of you may have read about 10 years ago. Uh, climate change is no longer, as you know, in Nepal, certainly in the future, it's having present effects, uh, which are relatively serious now, and they will get much worse, no matter what we do. And if we don't do very much, they'll get enormously worse. Uh, and they, they imply not only uh, warming and melting, melting of glaciers and rising of sea levels, but they imply massive socioeconomic disruptions and, and massive migrations of populations. And you know better than I what would happen if, if the Himalayas, uh, glaciers melt and the uh, uh, flow of water uh, down them into the subcontinent uh, ceases or in, into China ceases or becomes much less. So that, that's the, fir the first of the issues is there will be, if we do little or nothing, uh, if we can. Uh, the second point, which was also not at all true 10 years ago, is that the technology has, has changed rapidly. This is a very positive point. So it, there are now several reports in the United States indicating that the United States could have a zero carbon economy with essentially no economic cost. That is huge, huge investment, huge, huge policy changes, but a net minimal economic cost because you would no longer pay for fuel. You would, you would uh, sunlight is free. You pay a huge amount to build an, a, a, an electrify infrastructure to build the solar power and, and, and the wind power. But then once you did it, 
uh, you wouldn't have to have to pay for oil and gas and coal. So that the, it used to be believed that either it was impossible to have economic development and, and act on climate change, or that it'd be so costly that it would disadvantage many, many countries and, and people in many countries. And these are not true anymore. So that's the, the first of these points is very negative. Climate change is even worse than we thought 10 years ago. The second point is very positive. The technology has advanced so fast that it's possible, it's clearly possible to have a zero carbon economy, which, which functions at a, high, at a high level. We're not going back to have, having to wear hair shirts. Uh, so now, now let me answer, answer your question. That's this background. Um, what I mean by the international regime complex for climate change is a set of rules and institutions agreed by governments uh, that shape expectations and shape norm, norms for behavior, what states should do. The clearest example of a strong international regime in world politics now, which has been weakened somewhat recently, but has been quite strong historically, is the international trade regime. It has a very clear set of rules, has a WTO with a arbitration tribunal uh, with ways of resolving conflicts. Uh, that's, a, that's a strong international regime. The international regime complex means that it's, it's more fragmented. There is not a coherent centralized regime with a set of consistent arrangements which reinforce one another, which is true of trade and which on the whole true of the international financial uh, regime. There are a number of separate institutions. Uh, there, there is, at the time we wrote the article, there, there was the Kyoto Protocol, which was in the process of collapsing. Uh, there, were, there, were, there were also regimes for, for, for hydro, uh, for fluorocarbons, uh, 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 developed in Montreal in the in the uh, <clears throat> early 90s. Um, there were other. There are, there are now regimes for aviation, for shipping. Uh, there is there is the fluorocarbon regime, which has been extended to HCFCs, uh, as well as the Paris Accord. So these this, it's a regime complex because there are rules and institutions, but they're not nearly as strong as in a binding international regime. In the case of climate. Some of them are legalized, and, and some, some like Paris are not, are informal, uh, and are, are legalized minimally, but are, are not binding on governments. So that's what we mean by a regime complex. And it is a halfway house in a way. Uh, you well, would like to have a binding regime. Uh, so far, the politics has not been sufficiently supportive to have a binding regime. And the attempt that was made at having one in Kyoto was a failure. It was, it, it was premature, it was top down, uh, and it excluded developing countries from its constraints, which meant that the wealthier countries were unwilling to ratify because they felt that they would be uh, limited, whereas China and India and others would not be limited. So it was, a, it was a flawed attempt at a coherent regime. What we now have is a regime complex, which is looser, but more accepted. Uh, thank you, Professor. Let me move to the next question. Does the Paris Agreement make this regime complex more coherent, more of an international regime? Well, that's a great question. Um, and uh, it, it certainly was a big step forward from what was there before. So if we look at the history briefly, uh, uh, you start with, with, with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the basic document. 1992, it is a treaty, but it had no content. It basically said, we should work on climate change and we should enact some protocols to this treaty, which would be legally binding attempts to um, regulate climate change. So it's a legal framework uh, for inserting content. The first attempt at content was Kyoto in 1997. Kyoto tried doing this in a twofold way. Uh, it was a top-down treaty. It, it, it specified uh, how much, how much, how many cuts, what size cuts in carbon emissions each country, a major country or area, would have to enact, and that was negotiated. There was no particular scientific logic to it. It depended on who had negotiating power, who had supportive <coughs> regimes at home, and it's for secondly what it did, and it did it did it agreed this two years before in in the so-called Berlin Mandate. It agreed that developing countries would not be covered by these limits. 
So they covered Japan, the EU, the US, Canada, uh, the UK and other wealthy countries. They did not cover uh, of the developing world, including China and India. Uh, uh, China and India, as I mentioned before, were, were the largest emit were the not the largest emitters, but were on the most rapidly expanding path of emissions at the time. They were fairly small emitters, but they were growing very, very rapidly, and it could be seen, and, and, and it's happened, that they would grow industrially. So the, the wealthy countries said, this doesn't make sense for us to control our limit ourselves uh, and not uh, limit our two major competitors who are gonna, uh, whose increases will outshadow ours. And so the United States in particular, but also Canada and Australia and eventually Japan even, even though Kyoto was negotiated there, uh, refused to, to, to join or to continue or, or to maintain uh, the limits of, of the Kyoto Treaty. Uh, so we were stuck with nothing basically as that collapsed and it was an attempt at Copenhagen in 2009 to renegotiate it was a, the conference was a failure it, it, it collapsed in disagreement among the major states including the US and China uh, President Obama went into a sort of broke into the to the hotel room of the, where the Chinese were, were meeting with other developing countries and forced a rump negotiation uh, it was quite an extraordinary event and so it restarted the negotiations, but there was really no, no solution at Kyoto, uh, at, uh, at Copenhagen. But that process led through Durban in, in, in 2011, e eventually to uh, a, a US-Chinese agreement. The, the, crucial, the crucial step was a bilateral agreement in November 2014 between uh, President Obama and, and President Xi, where they agreed they would both take, take seriously the climate change issue and push for an accord. Uh, that was the first crucial step. The second crucial step was to make it a voluntary accord. It, had, it has two features which Kyoto didn't have, which are in a sense liabilities if you expect a binding international agreement, but they were uh, virtues if you want to get something adopted. And one is it's vague. And secondly, it's discretionary. Take the discretionary part first. Every country uh, puts forward an, an indicated national uh, contributions, uh, nationally determined contributions. Uh, so these NDCs, as, as they're called, are all developed by the countries. Nobody tells you what you have to do. You are told to de develop a plan which is suitable to you, which is serious about climate change. Uh, so they're nationally determined, they're discretionary. So, and uh, secondly, they're it's a vague requirement. It doesn't tell you what you have to do. It doesn't say you ha these have to add up, but some scientific body has to tell us that this means uh, a, a, that, that, that your emissions are consistent with a, the two degree warming. In fact, they're much less than that. They're not consistent with it. Uh, so it was, it, it, it's, it's an offer that no government can refuse because basically governments could set up a vision for policy, um, which would reduce, which if implemented, would reduce climate change emissions over time, but it'd be their successors that had to do anything. They can get the credit for saying we're good on climate, but my successors in 10 or 15 or 20 years, the ones are gonna to have to take the decisions that are tough on people. So who, who, can, who can turn down that sort of a deal if, if you're a politician? You, you look good and somebody else has the problem. So it was very clever from that point of view. But of course it meant that it's a vision, not a plan. Uh, it, it's, it's a vision of, of cooperation among countries. Uh, it's, not a, it's, not a plan, it's not a plan for doing it. It leaves all of, not just the details, but all the implementation, all the concrete policies for national governments to work on. So I think it was brilliant diplomatic. I'm, I'm not critical of it because the better, you couldn't, you couldn't do better in the political circumstances, but it's only a starting point from the point of view of solving the problem. Uh, thank you, Professor. Let's move to the third question. What needs to be done internationally to strengthen the international regime complex? Well, that's a great question also, because of course it follows from what I said a, a minute ago about the vagueness and the discretionary nature of, of, of Paris. It requires to be, to be filled in. Well, what we, what we need is uh, a, uh, uh, a set of actual policies which are developed and implemented by major countries. 
And this has several features. One, countries have to progressively tighten their NDCs, their nationally determined contributions, right? Uh, so they didn't, they added up, if, if all of them were actually implemented, it'd be about a 3.5 degree increase in temperature. That's way too high uh, uh, for the world. So that they have to be, these, these limits have to, have to be tightened. Uh, uh, secondly, they, they have to be uh, implemented. There have to be measures taken to implement them, which requires, in many countries, requires greater government capacity than we actually have now. Uh, it requires a building up of administrative and economic and other capacity for action, because you don't just wave a magic wand and get rid of emissions. You have to do a thousand different things in agriculture, uh, in, in industry, in transport, in buildings, to actually make it happen. Uh, you have to have renewable energy, you have to make your buildings more in, in, in cold countries, to at least make your buildings more, uh, uh, more thermal, better insulated. Uh, you have to change agricultural practices. Lots of things you have to do, which are very concrete and extensive. Uh, there has to be, in the long run, there's going to have to be a greater acceptance of market-friendly practices. A lot can be done by government action, but if you're going to have the kind of level of, if you're going to go to a zero carbon world economy, you're going to have to have a, a, a price on carbon at some point which makes it uneconomical for businesses or individuals to uh, waste uh, uh, to waste carbon and emit uh, uh, carbon unnecessarily. And now there has to be more aid for poor countries in this, in this process because it's not, it's not the case, of course, that everybody starts on, on a level playing field. So, and that's, uh, that's a tough one for the rich countries because self-interest, of course, drives world politics. And, the, it's a very indirect self-interest to say we have to help the, the, uh, the poorer countries, otherwise we're not going to solve this global problem. It's a lot more indirect than saying we're going to build solar power and employ our own people in building solar panels or in insulating our own buildings. Now, those seem pretty obviously self-interested. So that's, that has always been hard. It, it, the U.S. made, made pledges at, at Kyoto, which have not been met. John Kerry just repeated the pledge uh, uh, two, uh, two days ago. Uh, but a pledge is not a check. A check requires in the U.S. congressional auth authorization and appropriation, and that's not not automatic. Uh, so uh, those are those are are things that are needed uh, on the point on the from the point of view of uh, strengthening the regime complex. Now, I want to be. I'm feeling very optimistic right now about the process, much more than I have. <laughs> Um, in, in my lifetime, actually, since I've been working on it. Um, the most important thing is that we have, have a new, new administration in the United States. And the Biden administration is very much committed to climate change. And what, what shows up here is that it's not just one part of the government, not just sort of one climate minister or something. Um, throughout the government, there are people who are really committed to working on climate change. Uh, from the State Department, uh, we're where John Kerry is the international ambassador, but there's also a whole set of other people there, some of whom I know, some of whom my son who works in climate change policy uh, knows. Uh, there are, uh, Janet Yellen at, at Treasury is a long-term uh, climate change proponent. And of course, Treasury is a, is a crucial uh, element of this, uh, this process. Climate change is becoming a national security priority. So the National Security Council will be involved with it. So it's gonna be for the first time at the top level of the US government. And of course, Biden was the first elected president to campaign on climate change as one of his major issues. Obama mentioned it, but it was never a major issue in, in, in Obama's campaign. Um, and it, in, in Biden's campaign, it was. There is now a substantial organized movement in the United States uh, uh, for climate change. Uh, and furthermore, maybe equally or more important, American big business has decided that uh, climate change is important. They have to act on it, that it's in their own interest to act on it. So, and if you want to be cynical about American politics, you can say, or if, or if you're a Marxist or even a sort of quasi Marxist, like I have some sympathy with this. Um, if you want to look at the, at the center of power in the US, you look not just at Washington, but also at Wall Street. Uh, and when you have a firm like BlackRock, which is pushing firms, other firms hard uh, to, to 
implement carbon change policies, not just greenwashing in their programs, and is threatening them with being excluded from BlackRock's pension funds if they don't do so, that's serious effort. And when you, when you have the head of, head of GM pushing hard for electric vehicles, it's in their interest. They feel they have to do it, or otherwise uh, someone else will do it because they know it's gonna happen. Uh, when these are, things are happening, you have a tipping point coming. You, have a, you no longer have resistance by these firms. Now you have tremendous resistance by the auto firms. By, by, the, by the fossil fuel firms. And if we were to ask the political science question, what explains why some countries are climate leaders and some regions like the UK and the EU, and why some are climate laggards like Australia and the US and, and Canada, the clear dividing line is, do you have a fossil fuel industry? The EU and Britain have very minor fossil fuel industries and they're not important. Uh, the US, Canada, and Australia have big fossil fuel industries. They're politically and economically important. And so they're, that we're, they're gonna be laggards and we're gonna have to, have to push them. But now at least the US is, is, is pushing. It'll be, it'll be slow. Congress won't go along with everything. Uh, the Republicans are still very much uh, against taking serious government action on this issue. With, with a few exceptions. But I think that the movement is in the right direction, seriously in the right direction for the first time in my life. Uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> Let me move to the next question. Uh, what are the implications of US-China geopolitical competition for the international regime complex? Well, this is the really important issue. And you, you, <laughs> You and Nepal know a lot about uh, geopolitical competition involving China because you're right there between China and India, uh, and uh, you've been in you know, had to had, had to navigate those issues for for a long time. I think it's clear that the U.S. and China are in for a period of geopolitical competition, uh, and this is not surprising because in the history of world politics, the most dangerous times and the toughest competition has always come when a rising power confronts a formerly dominant and either static or declining power. So that's the history uh, of, uh, of, Germany, of the rise of Germany, of course, uh, against Britain in, in, the, in the run up to World War I. Um, and it's history of actually of the rise of the US vis-a-vis -vis Britain uh, in the late 19th century, which led to a much more peaceful outcome, but it, it was competitive, and it, there were there were there was discord and disagreement between them. So we have to accept there's going to be disagreement and discord between the U.S. and China. Uh, they have conflicting interests, um, both geopolitical and the South China Sea. Uh, so if you look at it from the U.S. point of view, China is trying to break to, to prevent the U.S. from having freedom of of naval navigation. From the Chinese point of view, they don't want American warships 12 miles off their coast, as the US wouldn't want Chinese warships 12 miles off its coast. So both sides have an obvious argument here, and, the, and it's not surprising they both are going to hold to that. So there are going to be points of geopolitical friction. Of course, Taiwan is maybe the most serious of them. Uh, and there are points of technological disagreement, of course, because of China. This is, again, an old story. The United States stole secrets from uh, uh, from England in 1812 to start its its, its industrial structure. Uh, every rising power steals secrets from, from the established powers, and the established powers don't like it, and they're both right in a sense. Uh, those who steal are not right morally, but they find that they have a, a, a strong interest in doing so, and those who resist the stealing can be moralistic, but they also have a strong interest in maintaining their dominance. So, so we're going to have to live with that kind of conflict. It's not, it's not going to go away. The other hand, what's really important for climate is to make sure that that, con that conflict isn't so pervasive that it affects everything, that it prevents cooperation on crucial, crucially important issues. And this can be done. It's, uh, uh, the US and China can cooperate. They both have huge interests in solving the climate problem. The analogy I look for is smallpox. You may, you may all know that smallpox was eliminated uh, uh, in the Cold War period and was eliminated by joint Soviet-American effort. At the height of the Cold War, when they were arming at each other and had their nuclear forces sometimes on, on, 
on hair trigger alert, they were working together against smallpox because it was a common threat. And they eliminated smallpox. We don't get vaccinated. I, I have a smallpox vaccination. Um, I was born in 1941, but uh, and, and my kids who were born in 1966 have them. My son who was born in 1972 doesn't have one because by that time it was, it was, it was in the process or, or, or had been eliminated. So this can be done, but it's very important that people thinking about the US-China relationship keep two things in mind. First, that it may be necessary to have uh, tough policies toward each other in, in, in various ways in the interests of these countries, that will happen. At the same time, it's very important that this not get out of, out of hand so that it spreads to every relationship between them, including ones, and most notably climate, where they have enormous common interests. Uh, let's look at the domestic politics. How important is domestic politics in determining the strength of the regional regime complex? Well, it's crucial. Uh, and I've been, in fact, I've been spending most of my time recently looking at US domestic politics because it seems to me that the international issues are all, all depend on that. If, you, if, you, if a country like the US has a, has a, a serious domestic policy, it can be credible at the international level. If it doesn't have a serious domestic policy, it can't be credible. Uh, no one's gonna believe what they say and no one's gonna take it as a, as a leader. Uh, and if we, as I mentioned before, if we look at variation among policies, whether whether you have a fossil fuel industry is a is a big source of variation. Now, one of my reasons for optimism right now is that the EU and the UK have both uh, taken steps which I thought I would have thought five years ago were almost impossible to imagine. They both pledged uh, zero <laughs> pledged zero net carbon by 2050. That's only 30 years from now. Um, and they both, and the EU has pledged 55% reduction by 2030, which is only 10 years from now, and which is measurable. So they actually, they haven't just said vaguely, we're going to reduce our, our carbon output. They've given a number and it's, it's a measurable number. We will, people will know in 2030 whether they met it or not, because it's, 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 it's operational. Uh, and therefore they have a great commitment to do so. Uh, so I think that we're going to see a lot of effort by the EU and the UK. Now, they're not a big part of the problem because they are already relatively efficient. So that'll have to spread elsewhere. But at least we have uh, two major economies that are extremely serious about this. Um, the US is lagging behind, but at least we have some effort in the US. So I heard a presentation yesterday on, on a webinar from a colleague in Potsdam, uh, Germany, very impressive about what the EU is doing, uh, and it, it will have to, they will have to institute new policies. They they can't do it with what they're doing now. They're going to have to have a, probably a both a lot of technological investment and uh, a hefty carbon tax or carbon fee. Uh, but this is they now have over both in the UK. Boris Johnson has become green. He's changed his tune totally. In 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 the UK and the EU, we have serious commitments that are hardly challenged across the political spectrum, unlike the US. So the right, the center right party and the center left parties are both in favor of the both in both jurisdictions. So they're pretty well set institutionally. So we're gonna have some leaders out there and some countries to sort of show the way. Uh, so let us look at the United States. What are the prospects for strengthening U.S. climate policy so that United States can again play a leadership role internationally? Yeah, great. I've been thinking about that a lot. I think you, you can divide these into short-term, medium-term, and long-term policy. Uh, in, in the short term, the president can do a lot. First place, Biden will reverse all of Trump's anti-climate measures. He will reinstate Obama's clean power, uh, power plan. And you know, even though Trump tried to reverse Obama's clean power plan, coal use fell dramatically in the US during Trump's administration because it's not economical anymore. It makes no sense to, to have a coal-fired uh, power plant. It's much cheaper to build renewables. And it's even becoming cheaper to build new renewables than to keep an old coal-fired plant running. And with some additional taxes, this will become even more so. So uh, 
Biden is, is restoring the Obama measures and taking further measures. Uh, for example, uh, forbidding uh, oil and gas drilling on federal lands as of today. Uh, so there, there are lots of things that you can, in the United States, you can do with executive orders. Um, we discover this with Trump, unfortunately, uh, uh, how much the president can do on his own in the United States, how much authorization he's been given. So a lot of that will happen, but that doesn't, uh, the president cannot institute a carbon fee or a carbon tax that requires Congress to act, uh, cannot uh, appropriate on his own huge sums of money for technological investment. Uh, or for or for restructuring infrastructure, uh, making low carbon infrastructure, or, or refurbishing buildings. That big money has to come from Congress. So the short term, uh, the president can do a lot, and I think probably in the short term can do some things legislatively. Um, in a sense, it's an advantage that we have this economic crisis brought on by COVID, because there'll be a big anti-COVID package, a kind of Keynesian spending package the purpose of which is to just put money in people's pockets. And I think the Democrats have the, have the good sense to make a lot of those programs to put money in people's pockets climate friendly, to make them plans to build climate friendly infrastructure, not just to build, to build back better, not just to build back the old way. Uh, and Biden's committed to that. And there are people, as I said, throughout the government committed to it. Uh, so I think we'll see uh, a pretty good not perfect, probably won't be enough, uh, a reinvestment program un under this $1.9 trillion uh, anti-COVID anti recession uh, plan that he has. And that's fairly popular, that, that'll go through because it's hard for opposition politicians to vote against an economic recovery plan. Uh, and they, they, they get labeled as you, you're trying to, they can, they can vote to reduce it, but they can't vote to wipe it out because that would, that would make them very unpopular uh, with, with the public. And, and we saw in Georgia, the Democrats quite won that election on the pledge to increase from $600 to $2,000, the individual checks. Now, I'm not a great fan of the individual checks. I think it's better to build infrastructure, which is climate friendly than just to put money in people's pockets to go buy more gasoline. Uh, but there'll be, there'll be compromises there, and it, it's too bad it has to be done so fast because if, if there were more time, you could build the infrastructure and really make it uh, make it climate friendly. But in, in the short term, we'll see those two things: uh, federal uh, executive regulatory action reversing Trump, and uh, in, in involving in the uh, recovery plan a lot of climate friendly action. And those wouldn't have happened if Trump had been reelected. Uh, in the in the in the middle term. Uh, it's going to depend on the U.S. policy. It will depend on how successful the administration can be in building coalitions. My view as a political scientist is that every time you make an investment on climate, you ought to not just ask the question, what will this contribute to climate, but ask, will this build a pro-climate coalition? For example, if you require unionized uh, American uh, labor to build uh, uh, renewable energy um, equipment, mm -hmm. you build political support. If you allow it to be shipped in from China, uh, you don't build political support. So that question needs to be asked about every plan. And if it is asked about every plan, uh, and there's a, there, there is a successful effort to build up political support, then, after, then in the long term, we'll be able to move to much more substantial even radical measures, uh, which will involve lots of investment, but also some sort of, of, um, of carbon tax. And the carbon tax will probably, in my opinion, be one where the funds are transparently um, returned to the public. So voters won't just vote for a tax. They don't, they don't vote for taxes. And they won't, they won't for, be asked to vote for a tax where the money, you know, trust us, we'll spend the money well. That's not going to work. Uh, but they might vote for, <clears throat> for a tax that says, uh, <clears throat> we're taxing the, the oil companies. Admittedly, you'll pay higher prices for energy, but you're gonna receive a check back. All this money from the tax is gonna recycle back to you. And my, my idea on this is that we should actually start with the check, that is borrow the money and give a check to everybody first and, and tell them that, that, well, this will be paid back by this fee we're imposing on the oil companies. 
think that's much more attractive politically than the, ta than the tax people first. So there's a short-term, medium-term, and a long-term strategy. In long-term, if you institutionalize a substantial carbon tax, then you're getting your all that's automatically getting a lot of act, a lot of action as every industry, as every business, and every household decides that it's in their own self-interest to save to, to to economize on carbon, to switch away from carbon, uh, just because it's more profitable for them. Uh, thank you, sir. Let, let's move to that in time. How do you see the possibility of United States ratification of UNIP clause? The last effort was made under uh, President Barack Obama. Again, another question that we have got from the audience is, what is your assumption for the maritime dimension of the international regime complex of climate change? Well, I'm not an expert on the, on the maritime dimension, but I know there's a set of, of, of negotiations uh, on, on shipping. Uh, shipping is a, major, is a major source of carbon emissions. There's a lot of inefficiency about it, and it's part of the international regime. Uh, so, and it's certainly, it's a case where it should be able to be handled because there is a, a large, you have a relatively small number of very large shipping firms um, which have an interest, and many of them have an interest in uh, their reputations. In the, in, in the past in shipping, it was a big issue in the 70s about uh, uh, oil, oil being dumped in the, in the oceans. Um, it may not have been very important ecologically, but it was pretty important politically for a while. And it turned it turned out that there was a, a, a convention was adopted which the shipping firms supported because it actually was uh, in the interest of those firms that cared about their reputations to have a serious action. And it was just the fly by night operations uh, which were um, hurt by it. Uh, so I think I think I'm pretty optimistic about shipping, but I'm not an expert on the shipping detail. What was your What was the first question? I didn't catch that. Uh, like. Uh, <laughs> of U.S. ratification of UNI clause. The last effort was made under President Barack Obama. So, of what clause? UN OS. Oh, 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 un, un close. Uh, yeah, the uh, the, uh, the the Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, Law of the Sea Convention, as you know, dates back from the seventies, and uh, it was uh, never ratified by the United States. Uh, I haven't followed what what um, what the prospects are are for that. Uh, there were it, it was odd because the U.S. Navy was in favor of. There was a large a large consensus of error. There was a small number of, as you know, the U.S. requires two thirds vote in the Senate to ratify a treaty, so it's a high barrier, uh, and there was partisan opposition. But even under Republican uh, presidents who actually nominally favored it, it wasn't. I, th I think, I think there has not in the U.S. been a, there's not a strong lobby to do it, and it, it, in 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 the U.S. when you have a two-thirds requirement in the Senate, even if you have a majority on your side, if you don't have a strong lobby to do it, people don't care a lot. They don't care enough to be able to make trade-offs and to give away something for it. It's probably not going to happen. So I think it would, and I don't know. Who the I don't think there's there are enough there's enough the U.S. is happily living with not not being a formal member of a club and I, I'm not sure if, if I were Biden I probably wouldn't spend political capital on it. Um, uh, Jimmy Carter spent political capital on the Panama Canal Treaty. He barely got it through. He felt it was so important to have a treaty of the Panama Canal. But even that, which seems like a sort of no-brainer, it was obvious we should have a Panama Canal treaty and regularize that, barely got through the Senate. And Carter had to twist a lot of arms, and I'm sure pay people off on other issues in, in order, order to get it. So he, he paid a pretty big price for it. So you think twice, if you're a president, you think twice before trying to put a treaty through. If it's not your high priority, you may say, well, we'll let that, let that one go. Don't think about it. Uh, so, uh, partially answer this question. Joe Biden has agreed to join the Paris Agreement and lead from the front. Do you believe that this would have a spillover effect and more conscious effort, especially by Global North? How far do you think the regime change in the US is going to change the climate approach and whether there will be any substantial paradigm shift or not regarding the policies and program about climate change? Okay, good. Well, I think that 
There are two things that we should point out that are encouraging. One is some people thought, I didn't, some people thought after Trump was elected that other countries would backslide on climate. They'd pull out of Paris also, for example. They would announce they're gonna leave Paris. No country did. Or they would stop doing what they did on climate. In fact, uh, during the Trump presidency, other countries, notably uh, India, China, uh, the EU and the UK all tightened, toughened up their climate policy. So there wasn't any backsliding. It, it wasn't the case that everybody said, well, the US is doing nothing, we'll just also do nothing. Uh, which suggests that they feel it's in their interest to act. It's not just, they're not just doing it because the US wants them to. Uh, if, so if the US, I think, when the, I think Biden will lead from the front. And as the US becomes, starts playing a positive role on, on, on climate, they will be working with the tide, so to speak. The tide's already already going their direction. They're not pushing, they're not trying to push it back or reverse it. Uh, so I think it will be positive. I think it may have um, particularly positive effects in uh, places like Brazil, which took advantage of Trump's anti-climate activity to backslide enormously on the Amazon. Uh, it, it may make, the, the, and, and it may have the effect of, uh, of giving other countries uh, like India, which is sort of this is ambivalent about this. India is ambivalent because they would actually benefit tremendously from heavy re renewable power and, and Modi has a big program for it, but they also have a big coal industry. And they have a lot of people who are worried about economic development being being restricted by, um, by, by climate plans. And they have a history of dragging their feet before Modi came in on climate issues. So for India, it, which is for which it's not a formal US ally, but the US is very important for India. For India, it's, it's almost sure to make them more enthusiastic about action because their biggest potential supporter is now pro-climate. Uh, so you about India, so let me uh, bring India in the debate. How yeah. India would or should play a role on the international stage concerning climate change? There's another question, how can US join hands with India under Biden to resolve climate change issues? Well, I, I'm very interested in that, in that issue. Um, I think that India is seen as, well, it's obviously the, the largest democracy in the world. And among developing countries, uh, it, is, it is by far the largest democracy. Uh, so it has a natural leadership role, has some credibility with, uh, with poorer countries that the rich countries don't have, uh, so that it's, it is a potential leader. Um, and, and I think that uh, in India is increasingly, Modi government is increasingly seeing that they have a self-interest in effective climate change policy, both because they'll be hurt by climate change, especially by, uh, by water, water issues and, and, and a, a decline in water availability in the Indus Valley and, 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 and also by desertification. So they have a, they have a narrow self-interest. They also have an interest in, as I mentioned before, being aligned with the US, which is now pro-climate. Pro uh, and they have a lot of, a lot of potential sun power. They have, they, uh, they're a good place for renewable energy. So in all these ways, India has a, has a self-interest in, in taking action on climate. And I, I think uh, we see a, a lot of progress in India. When, when I started studying this topic 10 years ago, India was the main, the main negative force. They were consistently negative on, on all, all international climate agreements. Um, they claimed it wasn't their problem. It's, uh, we're trying to develop, uh, don't, don't bother us with climate change. And that's changed fundamentally. In fact, I had an interesting experience. I, there, were, there were some Indian parliamentarians coming to Princeton maybe four, four years ago, and I was supposed to meet with them. And I hadn't, hadn't caught up on India's policy changes. So fortunately, before I met them, I did a little research and realized that India had turned around. And most of these, of these parliamentarians were actually energetically pro-climate, uh, which a week before I had not expected. So uh, it, it is a change. And I think it's a very positive change. And, and, and it will give, if I, were an Indi if I were Indian foreign secretary, I'd say this is a big opportunity for Indian soft power to be a, to be a leader uh, from the developing countryside. And of course, to push for more technical assistance, more financial aid, 
uh, more support from the rich countries. That should be part of the agenda. Um, so I think it's a real opportunity for them. And since Brazil is under Bolsonaro, is has doesn't have a coherent position on this. Brazil has ceded their opportunity. So if, if India is competing in a sense with Brazil and South Africa uh, for leader in Nigeria for leadership of the developing countries, it's got an open field on climate because those are three countries that are not leaders. Uh, so you just talked about the Is there a chance that the development of the green energy industry in China is faster than that in the US due to more authoritarian regime? And hence, China emerged as a superior power in the age of clean energy. China, China is, is advancing on all fronts in a very impressive way. And it is, uh, I mean, I don't like their, I don't like the authoritarianism of this regime, but you have to be impressed by their ability to, to accomplish things. Uh, and it's partly because they still have a comparative economic advantage. For example, they took the German ideas and the German orders for renewables 20 years ago and built a renewable in, industry and wiped out the German is, industry virtually. So they have this tremendous capacity at manufacturing uh, and they have the capacity to mobilize support and mobilize finance without the constraint of a minority party in Congress. So yes, they can act very fast and they have been very effective on this. China, uh, you also know more about this than I. I think every, every great power has its distinctive advantages and its distinctive liabilities that are often a, the other side of the coin of the advantages. So the United States, for example, in, in its prime and, and still to major, major extent, huge advantage in technological innovation. Most major technological innovations over the last 75 years have come from the United States. Often immigrants, <laughs> but they're people in the United States. And so the US has had this, this tremendous innovative capacity and has also had the soft power advantage of being, of being democratic until Trump almost, almost, almost overturned that. Um, so those are two huge American advantages. Uh, the United States was, has a disadvantage of being uh, arrogant, of being insular, of, of typically often in the last set of affairs, not, not listening to anybody else and assuming everybody should follow the US path. And that's, that's caused trouble for the United States in a variety, variety of places. And sometimes just bull, bullheadedly using military force when uh, it's not the appropriate instrument, re relying too much on its, on its military, in which Vietnam and, and uh, Iraq are primary examples in, in point. So now if we turn, turn to China, China's great strengths are its, its extremely energetic people who, were, who uh, 30 years ago were underemployed because they didn't have technology to work with. So there was a huge pool of, of hardworking and fairly skilled labor that was able, able to be put to work on issues like, like climate change. Uh, and its ability to act quickly as a government. It has two huge liabilities. One is that as an authoritarian government, there's not much, uh, there's no open discussion about flaws. There may be private discussion about flaws, but it's constrained. So if you start making mistakes, it's harder to correct them because you don't have an independent press or, or a, a, an opposition party with a vested interest in pointing out mistakes. Everybody is in covering them up. And of course the Soviet Union showed this over many decades when they couldn't, couldn't change their, uh, their rigid structures which were driving them into the ground. And the other problem I think China has is, is they also are arrogant. They have a commonality with the United States in that both the US and China culturally think they're the best place in the world. The US because we're the land of opportunity, we're the great democracy, we're the place where uh, the world was re reborn. China because they're the greatest ancient civilization on earth in their opinion, they're basically uh, the center, and they always have seen them build the center. This has cost them a lot in Africa, as you know, and it may have in Nepal too. They, they, they've come in with arrogant plans to um, bulldoze people in more than one way, uh, and that has backfired on them in, in the Belt and Road Initiative. That was uh, observable. Uh, their attempt to, uh, 
to make the, the South China Sea a Chinese lake has antagonized Vietnam, which should not, I mean, after all, Vietnam lost millions of people to the US in a war only, uh, only a generation ago. The Chinese shouldn't have pushed the Vietnamese into the Americans' arms, but they did. Uh, so, so that's the, so China has these advantages and liabilities, and you're going to have you're going to see them both play out in the next decades as well, because they're pretty deep. They're deep seated qualities: the capacity to act well and the incapacity to rethink your efforts and to give yourself a sort of more modest perspective. Um, Professor, let's go on to the impact of COVID. Has COVID-19 contributed to climate complexities or variations? If yes, how? I'm, I've been thinking about that. I've, I, I haven't reached a, 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 a firm conclusion. I'm not, I, I think that in, in the short term, in the short term, of course, it means a lower climate emissions, which are much lower in 2020 than before. But that's a, that's a short term phenomenon. It's not hugely important. Uh, what is important is, what will be important is what the impact of COVID-19 is on ongoing emissions. Uh, if you want my guess, it's only a guess. I, I wouldn't publish this because I, don't, I tend to publish research and not, not guesses. Uh, I would guess that COVID will be it will will help with climate because of we're exhibiting this right now, right? If you had invited me to come to Kathmandu, I might not have come. I said it was too much time and too much effort. If I had come, my carbon budget would have been substantial. I would have probably I would have flown all the way. I probably at my age couldn't have flown economy class. You would have had to ship me a business class. Um, that that's substantial carbon emissions right there. Uh, and we're using the equivalent of no carbon in, in, in this seminar today, happily. So, and I think that's going to become institutionalized. I don't think people will go back to the old plan, the old pattern of traveling around the world all the time. I think we'll see some of it because people want to see the world, and it's a good thing that people become more cosmopolitan. If they stayed home all the time, they'd be very ethnocentric, and it would be, have bad effects. Uh, but they don't have to travel as much as people in business have been traveling. Uh, in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, I have uh, a, a, a daughter and son-in-law who are very important in business, who are, well, they're, they're, they're leaders of business organizations. And, and they used to, I, I, I didn't know where they'd be any, any given week. They'd be somewhere in New Zealand or in, or in Singapore or in, or in the UK. They probably wouldn't be at home, right? They were traveling all over the place uh, for board meetings and for uh, other kinds of missions. Well, they're probably gonna cut that in half. They're going to decide that if they go to one board meeting in person a year, they can go to three uh, on, on Zoom and they can save a lot of time and effort for themselves and still achieve all, all their purposes. So I think we're going to see uh, COVID having a positive impact on, on a variety of very climate, uh, very emissions intensive practices, um, which people may not end because of climate itself and for other reasons but they all also think, well, that was a good thing because it reduces my climate budget. Uh, thank you, sir. Like, uh, let's move to the next question. How successful was the 2030 agenda of United Nations to control, to control climate change? The 2030? Agenda of United Nations to control. Yeah, target. Well, these are all targets, right? This is, um, this is, this is a vision. So every, but, but of course the real action uh, takes place with national governments doing things. So what the UN can do is to, is to create the right atmosphere to encourage and, and make it easier for national governments to say, look, we who, who want to act to say, we need to act because look what the UN said and look what our, our partners are doing uh, and to counter the argument that, well, why should we act if nobody else is, right? So that's a pretty strong argument. If, if nobody else is acting, it's a kind of strong argument to say, why should we act? We're, we're a poor, small country. Why should we take the lead if it's costly to us? Uh, so UN action is important to counter that. But the real, the real action, that, that's the vision. That's the vision for the relations part. The real action part takes place domestically. Um. So what steps are international organizations taking to pressurize the regime who are making it complex? 
Well, what's the most important is the is the is the UN COP process, the the Conference of Parties process. Process. That's what that's what after after, after all Paris was the culmination of one of one of the COP meetings. Every, every year there's a there's a meeting, and that was the most significant one in a long time. Uh, there's an important one coming up in November in Scotland, which the UK government is hosting. Uh, that COP process has been important because it's put it, it is created an opportunity for people inside governments to say we have to meet these targets. We have to have something to show to the next COP process. We have to come to Scotland in in in, in November 2021 and show that we're doing something. And and it tends to force action. Many governments, somebody has to force action in governments, and often it takes a deadline to force action. Uh, so that the COP doesn't do anything itself, so to speak, but uh, that is they can't implement anything. But they can say, well, we're having this meeting and everybody uh, is has to come in and, and bring a, an updated uh, 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 nationally determined contribution, an updated plan for how you're gonna implement it um, and it provides the opportunity then for people who are pro-climate in the government to say, well, look, we have to act and we have to bring get together a, a, a task force that involves the whole government and we have to have an agenda. And so that's what's, what's really important is what's happening now in national capitals because they know that in November, they don't wanna be embarrassed by coming to empty handed say, well, sorry, we didn't work anything out for, uh, for Scotland. So that's, that's what the UN can, can do most effectively. And I, and I think the COP process is doing it well. Um, and it's doing it well partly because I haven't mentioned the IPCC, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. There's a scientific process with the IPCC which parallels this under the UN framework. Um, and that has given a scientific credibility to the climate change movement and has been there have been, of course, the, the climate deniers, especially in the U.S., and how it worked. But you have this very distinguished global pattern uh, uh, panel of scientists, which it really is global now. It's not just rich countries. They've made a big effort to to include people from uh, competent scientists from developing countries. Um, and so mm -hmm. you can point to that those reports if somebody says, "Well, uh, this is this is just uh, a hoax," or well, you've got a volume like this with leading scientists with lots of detail and lots of charts showing that it's not a hoax. Uh, let me, what, what did you suggest to states for the incorporation of climate refugees? How can a global regime ensure compliances of ecobiotic climate refugees at a time where migration is such a taboo? Okay, well, the, the, the climate, um, this gets into the question of uh, climate refu refusals. I'm interpreting that as uh, countries that really won't take action on climate. Uh, and Russia might be, might be a candidate. Uh, uh, Brazil, if Bolsonaro remains in power, might be a candidate. Uh, uh, what can you do about them? Well, I, I think the big question, th this revolves around uh, the question of border adjustment taxes. If, you, if we move to a situation where all the leaders have some sort of price on carbon, they call it a cap and trade or a system like the European ETS, or they call it a, uh, a tax system or a fee system. Anyway, they're, they're putting a price on carbon. And therefore their industry, including their export oriented industry is paying this price on carbon for all of its, pro all, all of its production. Then of course they, they they have to worry that some other country is not does not have a price on carbon, and their industry is exporting into the home country and undercutting them, so that the industry in the country which had a price on carbon goes bankrupt because it can't compete. That's unacceptable. Uh, it's economically it's not fair, but it's also economically and politically unacceptable. So one thing we're going to see uh, to deal with the refuse the Next, is some sort of carbon club with penalties for not having a sufficient carbon um, response. And that may be a border adjustment tax. It may be that exports from that renegade country get taxed heavily if they come into uh, kind of members of the club. Now this can only work 
if um, there's overwhelming support for it. So it, all, it can only work if, in the real world, if the US, China, uh, Japan, and the European Union and the UK all decide they're going to join, join this cover. Uh, but that, at some point, when there's enough solidarity among them, this would be the way to not to have to worry about the odd renegade country that's that's refusing to go along, because they'd be sort of forced forced to go along. I mean, not forced by by coercion, but forced economically to go along if they want to avoid this kind of ostracism and, and the carbon tax. Um, Professor Cohen, thank you very much for your discussion. We learned a lot. I'm sure all our audience benefited from it. We still have lots of questions, more than 30, but we have come to the end of the program. We are great, really grateful for your time and thank you for your kind presence. We hope to see you in real in Kathmandu or maybe other parts of the world. We'd also like to thank our participants for their kind presence and wonderful questions. Professor Cohen, have a nice day and good night to all our participants from Asia. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks for inviting me.